Hello, thank you for joining us for the 23rd annual virtual elder abuse conference, serving older adults during times of isolation. This conference is presented by the Syracuse Area Domestic and Sexual Violence Coalition's Elder Justice Committee. My name is Lori DiCaprio Lee, and I am the ID Theft and Outreach Coordinator at Vera House. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge some recent events. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted issues of inequality. Older adults, those who live in poverty, and members of black and brown communities have been more severely impacted. The Elder Justice Committee values all older adults and stands in solidarity with the black community. We pledge to uplift the voices of black people in our community and strive to fight the injustices that have led us to this moment. Thank you. So moving on to other announcements, all webinars offered during this conference are free thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. And I want to particularly recognize our platinum sponsors, Loretto and the Onondaga County Department of Adult and Long-Term Care Services, our gold sponsors, Syracuse Jewish Family Service and Wegmans, and our silver sponsors, Alzheimer's Association of CNY, At Home Independent Living, Community Bank, Countryside Federal Credit Union, Krauss Health, Fulton Savings Bank, the Syracuse University School of Social Work, and Touching Hearts at Home. More information about all of our sponsors can be found on Vera House's website. The support of these sponsors not only funds this webinar series, but also extends beyond the conference to continue elder abuse education and prevention outreach after the event. One last announcement before we begin the webinar. The chat feature is disabled. However, you can ask questions using the Q&A. Today's webinar is Substance Use and Social Isolation in the Older Adults During a Pandemic, How Can We Help? And our presenter today is Karen Morrow, ACM ORS Counselor 2, the Older Adult Recovery Services at Krauss Health. And so with that, Karen, I'm turning it over to you. Thanks, Lori. I'm just gonna share my screen right now with everyone. Um, I wanna introduce myself to you. I'm Karen Morrow. I'm the Older Adult Recovery Support Counselor at Krauss Chemical Dependency. And I'm happy to be talking to you today about this very, very important topic. And I'm going to turn off my video now so we can concentrate on the webinar. And again, thank you for joining me. I wanna draw your attention to the first slide, which is, um, it's talking about the distribution of a study done in the United States on older adults regarding loneliness. And as you can see, about 48% of this pie chart represents older adults who experience loneliness, whether it be frequent or occasional. And I think it's important to point out the difference between social isolation and loneliness. They're two different things, although they're related. Social isolation is really the objective measure of social contacts and loneliness is the perception of one's social isolation. So it's important to make that distinction. Karen, I wanna just interrupt for one second. We're sure. still seeing the first slide. Okay. Sorry about that. There we go, thank you. Uh, Perfect. Um, if you go on to drill down on who is most affected by loneliness, um, I'm sure it's no surprise to most of you that the adults who are in poor health um, suffer more loneliness and social isolation. Um, and if you further drill down on who's at risk, again, the topic of poor health comes up in disability. And then there's substance use and behavioral health issues. And we're going to talk about the relationship between social isolation and substance use. And then you have cognitive health issues. And this is really important to know because the lack of interaction can affect one's cognitive health in such that um, the less interaction that one has, the, the actual neurotransmitters in the brain can be impaired from the lack of interaction. And social isolation is a different experience from the research for each gender. They did research on males and females and they found that 
after the loss of a spouse or a significant other, um, many males had a harder time with social isolation and loneliness because they didn't have the robust social contacts um, before the loss and females fared better. And then seniors who identify as LGBTQT also experience a greater risk, uh, maybe due to uh, estrangement from family and friends uh, or their smaller support system. And then I'm sure that we've all heard or, or been um, experienced in our clients, seniors who have downsized or recently moved, whether it be out of their home um, that they had for many years or move closer to an adult uh, child and they experience a greater risk for social isolation. And then to round out the list, language barriers and transportation issues. Transportation is a huge issue with social isolation. Um, and I think this is something we need to focus more attention on in our community. And at the end of the webinar, there's going to be a handout. Um, I think it's a great resource. I know I've used it for my patients. It's put out by the Onondaga County Office for the Aging regarding senior transportation options. And these are really for patients that um, may have Medicaid but need transportation for non-medical appointments or patients that fall between the cracks that don't have Medicaid but don't have um, money to pay for private transportation. Um, and that'll be available at the end of the webinar. And then I think from my group here at the clinic, um, my 50 and older group, single widowed, separated and divorced um, clients are at greater risk. And I saw this time and time again during COVID when we would talk about social isolation, my patients that were single and living alone had a much harder time than those who live with family or loved ones. And social isolation has been linked to increased death, dementia, depression, and elder abuse. And the risk is even higher than there is um, of death from heart disease and cancer. In a study by AARP, they equate the effects of social isolation is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes per day. So this truly is a public health issue we should all be concerned about. And prior to the pandemic, there was already so many reasons why an older person might be socially isolated due to death of a loved one or poor health, and again, lack of transportation. Socially isolated adults cost the US healthcare system an additional $6.7 billion in health-related spending, according to a study by AARP. And this rivals any other chronic disease like CHF or COPD. And as for those of you who work in healthcare and hospitals or clinics, uh, we know that social isolation and loneliness is a major driver for repeated visits to the hospital and the emergency department. And in fact, I know um, from my experience working in case management and social work, we had a patient that kept um, coming to the ED for you know, maybe some COPD issues and just repeated um, ED visits was really no acute medical issue. And when you drill down a little bit more um, with this patient and she subsequently got transferred to a nursing home, we found out that the real issue is the real reason she kept coming to the ED is she didn't want to be alone. She was afraid she was going to die alone. So I think that's, uh, you know, it's worth our time to delve into some of these issues and find out the reasons why. And it's brought the attention, you know, um, to primary care with primary care doctors beginning to screen for loneliness and social isolation. And they're recommending the prescription of physical activity and socialization for their patients. And even uh, insurers have kind of jumped on the bandwagon in uh, understanding the link between healthcare utilization and social isolation because they're starting to put some benefits into the package for um, the recipients for Uber and Lyft services, as well as some meal and food delivery services. So social isolation we know is measured by the number of contacts, but it's important to note the quality of the contacts, not the quantity. You might have a lot of social contacts and still feel socially isolated, or you may have very few social contacts and, and not have an issue with loneliness or social isolation. Um, I have a patient right now who told me that he's no different before COVID or during COVID. He has the same number of contacts and he's not feeling lonely or isolated, but for most people that hasn't been the experience. So how can we help? I know that for my patients, um, regular phone contacts that they could rely on where I called at the same time, the same day, every week was a huge help. You know, creating custom lists for your clients or your patients that always have on their um, food pantries or food services that deliver 
transportation is low or no cost, and substance abuse and mental health referrals. And at the end of the webinar, I had have attached um, some that you could view that I found helpful to me. Uh, there's a one page printout from uh, Onondaga County on substance abuse and chemical dependency referrals and mental health that I think you'll find helpful. And so for your clients and their families, you know, do they have a backup plan? You know, what happens if the person who takes care of them or checks in on them gets sick, um, maybe from COVID or from another illness, you know, what would be the plan? And I can't emphasize enough that pets are really a, a wonderful thing for social isolation and loneliness. All throughout the research, it shows how much is beneficial. And there was a study done by Mars Pet Care where pet owners, um, as compared to others who did not own pets with a similar condition of heart problems, fared much better and had a much better um, outcome with their health from having a pet. And I'll direct your attention to the slide. This is a person who, you know, uh, is feeling very isolated and, and has the words help all over it. And the reason why I put this slide in here is because I know for my patients, the one thing that's difficult is to ask for help. And they learn that through their recovery journey, they can't do it alone. They need to reach out. And so what happens with loneliness and social isolation is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for many of our patients and clients. They feel like their time and their attention that someone doesn't want to spend with them because they're not worthy of their time and attention. So they give off a lot of negative energy. And then the people that they want to be with feel rejected as well. And it just becomes this vicious cycle. So how do we help them? What kinds of things can we ask our patients and clients to help get at the root of what's really going on? Here are some questions we can ask them that will help. Are you content with your friendships and relationships? Do you have enough people that you feel comfortable with asking for help at any time? And are your relationships as satisfying as you want them to be? Empowerment. <clears throat> this is something we can do. And we can empower our patients and clients to ask for what they need to help them find their voice, to help empower them to realize that they have worth and that they are, they are worthy of someone's time and attention. One thing that came pretty apparent right away with COVID is the digital divide. And that is where some parts of the population have access to technology while others don't. And my patients um, before COVID, many of them didn't have smartphones, laptops, or computers. They would go to senior centers or libraries to access the internet. So when COVID happened, there was a real divide between some of my patients that had the equipment to use and some that didn't. So we concentrated mainly on telephone interaction for our group work and our individuals. But the ones that did have the technology, they could have used it for maybe more robust um, treatment like video conferencing and emails and things like that, didn't really know how to use the technology. So there's an issue of the lack of confidence, you know, fear about using it. So I think our approach has to be twofold in that we have to find ways, innovative ways to provide seniors that um, don't have access to computers and smartphones um, access to them, and then the training to show them how to use them. A study by AARP found that those between the ages of 50 to 69 experienced a significant increase in the use of technology, and that's great, but there's a drop-off after age 70. And sometimes the cost associated with this just makes it too difficult um, and unreachable for many of our patients. If you know of any programs in the community um, that exist right now, please feel free to give input um, during this webinar or afterwards, um, because this seems to be um, an area where some national companies have taken part in programs for training and low cost equipment loans. But I haven't come across too many programs here locally. So if you know of some, please let us know. And this is something that I used. It's just a kind of a little uh, to-do list I use with my patients because I felt like I know many of mine in the 15 older group were told they can't, couldn't go out of the house when COVID first happened. They couldn't even go out for the um, doctors and they were told to stay in. And so we started talking about how it was important to keep a regular schedule, how even if you didn't have anything to do that day, you should get up, get dressed, take your medication. And then we started talking about what could they do in their space to keep themselves you know, connected to others and 
we made an agreement. They were, they were going to reach out to at least two people a day minimum. It couldn't go lower than that. And then they were going to look at things that they could do in their home. You know, maybe if they were able to get out, they could plant some flowers or maybe if they were with a, you know, if it was okay with their doctor, they could do some exercises in their apartment or their house. And then we talked about how maybe they could do one thing that they'll be glad they did later on after COVID is over, which we know it will be over at some point. So maybe working on organizing those pictures, you know, or calling up a friend or family that they haven't spoke to in a while. Social isolation and substance abuse. You know, we know that they're connected. And I'm gonna play for you a video of Dr. Talani Ajabe, who's our chief medical um, doctor here at Chemi Cross Chemical Dependency. He's gonna talk a little bit more about this topic. Good afternoon. My name is Talani Ajabe. I'm the Chief of Psychiatry and also the Medical Director, Chemical Dependency Treatment Services at Cross Hospital here in Syracuse. Hi, Dr. Jave. Thanks so much for talking with us today. Thanks for um, having me. Sure. So today's topic is focused on substance use in older adults and social isolation, specifically during COVID pandemic. So I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you about the topic. And if you don't mind, I'd like to begin. Okay. The first question is dealing with the increase in substance use amongst the age group of older adults, specifically from about 2.8 million adults in 2006 to 5.7 million in 2020. So that's a huge increase. What do you think is the reason for this? And what are some issues that are specific to older adults with regard to substance use? Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, I think this is a very important topic that uh, over the past few decades, not so much attention has been paid to it, but I've seen this topic coming up a lot more um, in uh, the field of addiction uh, in recent years. I believe the major driver for that topic coming up is uh, related to people that we all refer to as the baby boomers. These are people who were born between the year of, um, 1946 to 1964, right after the Second World War. So, according to the U.S. Census, uh, uh, Census Bureau, uh, about 2.5 million births were registered the three years after the, uh, the Second World War. So these are the people that are becoming of age, uh, they becoming older adults around this period of time. So with that unprecedented number comes a lot of responsibility. So a study that was conducted about eight years ago tells us that by 2020, which is this year that we're in, we're gonna have about 112 million people that are gonna be aged uh, 50 and above. I would like to be the baby boomers that we're talking about. Right. And uh, a lot of them were gonna be baby boomers. <clears throat> and also, in the same vein, we also have documentation there. And the same year, about 5% of those people, which is about 5.7 million, are going to need addiction-related services. If you know anything about addiction, that's a very big number. So unfortunately for us, we do not have age-appropriate services in terms of screening, intervention, treatment for people of this age group. So if you're asking about what's the underlying cause of this problem, the two is perspective true. Like I said, there's a historical perspective um, in which these people were born at a time when um, by the time they were teenagers, like in the 60s and the 70s, there was a, a switch in the drug culture in the United States. So that was the age of uh, the, the, what we all refer to as the age of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There was a normalization of drug use around that time. Um, uh, it was new. A lot of drugs were coming into the into the society. It was new. It felt good, and uh, people caught up to the culture. 
I wasn't here then, but I know, I, from my understanding, people felt, uh, you felt out of place. You felt weird if you weren't doing drugs then. So it was a good thing. A lot of people had good feelings about it. According to the literature that I saw, these people were much healthier, they walked out more, they did more exercise, they were much healthier than the previous generation. There was a sense that the drug, the drug actually made them feel good. So sometimes that's the last feeling they had of that period of time. That's when they were teenagers. So the drug culture came in when the current baby boomers were teenagers. And if you understand anything about addiction, most onset of addiction starts when people are teenagers. 67% um, of people who have addiction-related issues said they started using around the age of, um, by the age of 17. 67% have started by the age of 17. 75 percent, three out of four, have started using by the age of 25. So that's the period of time the baby boomers came in. So that's the historical perspective. The other things that put them at risk is what now happens later in life. Now you can imagine, you're a baby boomer. Um, most of them are now retiring. Um, so there's a lot of uh, somebody who's worked for the, for the for 40 years non-stop in their life, now they suddenly find themselves in a situation where they're retired and they're home and they have nothing to do. So boredom is a big problem in this age group because of lack of interpersonal interaction. A lot of them have suffered traumatic losses in life. They've lost loved ones, they've lost spouses, they've lost friends. Sometimes they've even lost children. They've witnessed generations behind them dying out. This is traumatic. Also, they, a lot of them are also experiencing what I would call um, a decline in functioning. So physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, psychologically, there's a lot of declining that happens as they get older. Um, so, and sometimes when people start experiencing symptoms related to those issues, they tend to self-medicate with substances. Um, you can imagine some of the medical issues you can think of would be people having more chronic pain as they get older. The chronic pain, they get prescribed medications, which leads to unintentional addiction. So sometimes people use drugs just to feel better, mm -hmm. right? They're dealing with depression or other more symptoms. They're dealing with anxiety. Uh, they're dealing with insomnia. They're not sleeping well. And they get prescribed medications to help them. Or well, like I said before, they have chronic pain and they get prescribed opioids for chronic pain. But unfortunately, sometimes the brain take it on for the worse. They start developing a, a dependence on some of those pills and tending towards addiction. So, like I was saying, sometimes getting into addiction can be unintentional, maybe in an effort for the elderly to just want to feel better. And we have doctors and other providers who also are very, um, more likely to want to prescribe to the elderly because we want them to be comfortable. So mm -hmm. the final point I will make about that also is the part that has to come from the providers as a contribution to addiction right now. There's a, what, what you may know as reverse ageism. Right. In which, yeah, in which um, we tend to want to see the addiction in the elderly, yeah. right? So we need all the early symptoms, the early signs of addiction, because we just don't want to believe that they're addicted to drugs. Right? No, it's not very likely. So a lot of this, the older, older adults are not being screened for all these substance abuse related right. issues. So it ends up being a situation where um, we, they pass through the system, with many opportunities for us to be able to ask certain questions, be able to and now provide interventions to help them, but because we don't, we don't want to imagine that my 75 year old patient is doing drugs or is addicted to drugs, right. are overlooking. Or sometimes you feel, some people actually, sometimes you feel even the family is one of the provider of the family is thinking, you know what, it's okay for her to drink. How much time does she even have left? That's she right. just, you know, just leave her alone. But you know what, these things get worse and worse and worse and they have serious consequences down the road. So those are some of the things that I think um, contribute to addiction um, in the elderly as it is right now. Thank you. Thank you. So 
we know that social isolation can lead to substance use, which in turn can cause social isolation. So as addiction worsens, relationships are damaged and friends are lost, which creates even more feeling, feelings of loneliness and isolation. And then it becomes incredibly hard to cope with those feelings without drugs or alcohol. Therefore, we can really say that social isolation is a cause and effect of addiction. And I know for my patients, um, they, they were telling me when we were talking on the group line about triggers before COVID, we would talk about people, places, and things, and there were specific things that could be a trigger for them. And then after COVID, they basically said to me, COVID is a trigger. Being alone is a trigger. Being isolated, this is all triggers. So, you know, this is why this issue is so important to talk about in addiction recovery, especially for the older adults in our service. So if you have a patient that you're working with or client, and maybe you suspect that they're using substances, what kinds of things can you look for to maybe start a conversation if they're not revealing to you that they do have a problem? You know, there's definitely some medical signs and psychosocial signs. And I would say that this is not an all-inclusive list. And some of these can be actually due to another issue other than substance abuse. But if you start to see some of these things like incontinence, increase of falls with injuries, memory issues, depression or anxiety that's worsened, and a lack of response to medication, you might be able to start a conversation with your clients or patients about this. And then there's other signs too, impaired hygiene, family conflicts, and then falls, like I said, with injuries. Falls is a big one, and I think that would be a clue to kind of delve more into with an older adult. And then some myths, and Dr. Ajabe spoke to this a little bit about kind of like a reverse ageism, where we don't want to believe that older adults use drugs. You know, we also feel that, you know, they've lived their life, they should be able to do whatever they want. And it's important to note that about 11% of all seniors that are admitted to the hospital, it's a direct result of a substance abuse problem. And half of all nursing home patients have medical issues stemming from substance abuse. So this is something that we should all be aware of and concerned about. Um, we also hear sometimes that the older adults are set in their ways and they can't change. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. My patients um, in the older adult program not only maintain, attain abstinence, but maintain abstinence. Some have been sober and clean for probably 20 years and had some type of crises and may have relapsed and they're back on track again, eager to live the best life that they can. And then further, which I think is a huge um, bias in ages attitude is that their substance abuse makes sense. Because given their poor health and their losses, that it just makes sense that they would use drugs or alcohol. And I think that that's um, something that we should check because we wouldn't be saying this about a younger person who had a drug or alcohol problem. There's further risk factors that you can look for. And like, once again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but some of the things that you might find um, are, you know, um, polypharmacy, once again, physical disability and poor health is a risk factor and previous substance abuse. So if somebody cope with their losses and stress by using substances in the past, they may be at risk um, to do that again. And we see that a lot in chemical dependency um, social risk factors, social isolation is right on there. That's a big one. And um, also bereavement and grief. And then the loss of a job or the loss of a vocation uh, for many of our patients that signals um, a time where they become um, more apt to engage in drug and alcohol use. And so what type of disorders are, are affecting the older adults? Right now, alcohol is one that is, is um, a huge problem in the older adult. One in 10 seniors relay that they binge drink, and this is steadily increasing over the years with uh, increase in binge drinking among females over the age of 60, okay? Tobacco use disorder, 14% of patients that are 65 years and older report using uh, smoking cigarettes in the last 12 months. Cannabis use disorder is probably the most widely, um, uh, the most widespread problem for drug use in the older adult population. And there are some patients that uh, present with stimulant use disorder like methamphetamines, hallucinogen disorders, and about 36% of older patients who present for treatment for substance abuse present with an opioid use disorder as well as other substances. So how do you determine if 
your patients or your clients um, have a problem with substances, what are you going to look for? You're going to look for criteria. The criteria is based on behavior. So are they using substances in a way that's hazardous? So are they trying to get in a car and operate a vehicle or putting themselves in dangerous situations? And is the substance use affecting their relationships with others? Um, are they neglecting major roles that they're responsible for, like work or caregiving? And are they experiencing any physical symptoms of withdrawal? Um, in the case of alcohol, that could be deadly. Um, but there's all, all different types of symptoms of withdrawal, both psychological and physical. And then there's tolerance. Do they have to keep using the substance in greater, greater amounts to get the same effect? And have they made repeated attempts to cut back or quit that were not successful? And the physical and psychological problems that we reviewed earlier related to use and are they giving up things that they once loved to do because of the substance? And cravings are a huge issue that we can treat here in the clinic with medication-assisted treatment. And we can talk about that a little bit more. Dr. Ajabe, I've done some research about medication-assisted therapies, and there's been some real success with older adults who come to treatment for Uh, for alcohol use and opioid use disorders. Can you tell us more about medication-assisted therapies? Thank you for that question. Um, medication-assisted ther assisted treatments are, are based off of the understanding from a lot of research that has been done over the past couple of decades, which shows that addiction is a chronic brain disease. Right. So if we now believe addiction is a chronic brain disease, sometimes we need ongoing treatment that could be lifelong to, for people to live meaningful lives, live healthy lives, and also be productive. So one of the, one of the best treatments that have been discovered is what we, what we describe as medication-assisted treatment. Two reasons why people use drugs on a regular basis is to prevent withdrawal symptoms and also to eliminate cravings for drugs. Withdrawal symptoms are most times they're time limited, but cravings are for life. So you can imagine even an adult who has used drugs in the past and there's a resurgence of drug use in the elderly stages because they have a return of their cravings for that drug a lot of times. So what needs to, what now has happened is that a lot of studies have showed the effectiveness of these type of treatment in ensuring a lifelong treatment if somebody needs it. So these are drugs that have been studied, they've been known to be very effective, and they've been known to save lives and allow people to have a good quality of life. That's what they do. Now, the only thing that I need to uh, have to point out to you is that there's been extensive research done over the past two decades, like I said, but the problem is that there's been limited research in the older adult population. If you look at the studies that have been done, most of the um, people who are, who are recruited for those studies are people in the younger age group. So we haven't seen the data on how effective these treatments are for the adults, even though we anticipate that they will also work for them. That also being said, we also need to look into, okay, if we decide this treatment is for them, what are the appropriate doses and appropriate um, frequency of administration of this treatment, considering the fact that the older adults are now going through a lot of physical decline. The liver is not metabolizing drugs the way it used to. The kidneys are not eliminating drugs from the body the way it used to. Do we need modifications when we're treating adults with these conditions? So the studies have shown that the medications work. But how do they work for the older adults? So I am more of advocating for more studies to be done involving older adult population to know what really works for them. From a general perspective, the best way to treatment in addiction is to have a pharmacological or medication-based treatment plus a therapy-based treatment. Plus a therapy-based treatment. So you do both 
counseling and therapy, and also do what we call psychosocial treatment, and we also do medication treatment. I can imagine that will work for adults, but we need to have more research being done. Alcohol is the most abused substance or most misused substance in the older adult population. We have treatments that have been studied that have been studied in the younger population which can be very effective in treating um, uh, things like cravings for alcohol. I can imagine that it will work. I'm talking about now Trexone, I'm talking about Camprosate, um, less likely that sulfur on it. I can imagine that that kind of treatment can also work for adults, but it might have some modification in how the treatment is done. Um, the uh, uh, opioid addiction, we have methadone, like you said. We have uh, buprenorphin, also known as suboxone. We have naltrexone for that, like you said. I can imagine they'll work for adults as well, but do we need some kind of modification? I know that methadone is, a full, is an opioid, and I know sometimes opioids will cause weakening of the bones, osteoporosis, will cause people to be more deconditioned. Is it the best kind of treatment for adults or they would be better off with suboxone? So we need more studies to be done to know what is really best for this age group. So I'm more for advocating for that than to um, start treating them as though they were in their 30s and 40s when they are in their 70s. So I'm, I'm more towards that, but in general, these treatments work, but they've not been well studied for the older adult population. So um, that's what I can say about that. Thank you. So we talked about the myths, and Dr. Ajavi talked about a little bit about medication-assisted treatment. And now we need to talk about the realities. So these are the realities that I find with my older adult patients. They're just as likely to engage in treatment as younger as younger patients. They absolutely respond well and they're eager to make changes in their life. And actually they have better attendance at group and are more adherent to medication regimens. They're also really positive about seeking help and they tend to view help um, not in a very oppressed way like I came here because my family member wanted me to come, but they really want to make their lives better. What can we do? So we need to realize with our patients and clients that even small amounts of drugs or alcohol can lead to serious disability and impaired function. Some of their use and abuse might be masked by another medical issue or a psychiatric illness. And detoxification may be needed depending on the substance and the severity of the withdrawal and other medical issues that they're dealing with. Studies have shown and the research has shown that age-related groups and interventions are successful. And I can tell you from personal experience that patients who seek care here often ask for a group to be in with people of their age, and they're surprised to learn that we actually have one. Amongst the many different groups at Krauss Chemical Dependency and Services, we have a group specifically that focused on older adults dealing with substance abuse issues. And as I said, the group is called ORS which stands for Older Adult Recovery Support Services. My members share their journey and they shared in an atmosphere of shared life experiences. And many of them said that the best part of the week is coming to group. If you, any of you have a patient that's 15 or older or you feel has a problem, please don't hesitate to either call for them or have them call us at admissions at 470-8340. Okay, um, I just wanted to back up a bit, if you don't mind. Um, I think I might have missed a slide by Dr. Ajave, and I don't want to miss anything by him. <laughs> Can you hold on and give me one second while I double check this? I did. I'm going to play that for you, and I apologize, it's a little out of order, but I think it's important. One. So Dr. Javi, social isolation was already an issue for our patients prior to the pandemic of COVID-19. And now with the pandemic, what are some suggestions you have uh, for service providers and agencies to help these patients um, in the community? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. And, and I completely agree with you that uh, the current uh, restrictions put upon us by the ongoing pandemic uh, is, is 
it's, it's a bigger tool, they're going to audit all the population. Um, and that's because they already have things in place that already significantly impact their day-to-day -day functioning. I spoke earlier on about you know, the fact that uh, people have worked for their, all their life and now suddenly they're retired and they have to stay home. There's a tendency for the younger generation who are constantly busy trying to live their lives to abandon the older adults and they're feeling very lonely already. And on top of that, we have the shelter in place because of the ongoing pandemic in, um, in the world, actually. So, but there's different things that we can do um, as a society to help our older adults to get through these very difficult times. So there's three broad categories of things that can be done. So there are things that the, the adults themselves can do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to get through this. There are things that um, family members, support network can do to support them. Um, or and support what I mean, family members and friends can do to support them. And there are also things that service providers, agencies, medical providers, psychiatric providers can do to support them. So let me start with the patient themselves. You know, um, there's some basic things that they can do. Um, one of the things that I think might be helpful is for them to, um, first of all, Come up, come up with a routine, a consistent routine that they follow every day in their day-to-day -day life. Um, so that can involve things like, you know, having scheduled time for, okay, I'm going to wake up at this time of the day every morning. I and mean, then first of all, I'm going to take care of myself in terms of my hygiene, because with good hygiene comes a good feeling. Yes. Um, take care of your hygiene. Um, dress up, make sure you look good, you dress good, you smell good to yourself, make sure you take care of your nutrition. Uh, whatever form of exercise you can get inside your house, you know, some people have things that are already set up for them to exercise, to stretch, to do things. You have that kind of structure in place. Um, also, they can keep diaries of the things they're doing and so that they're not missing anything. Check your day to day out. Check your schedule to see what you need to do for that day. Do you have any appointments to keep that day, which most of the time now is uh, via telemedicine, okay. right? You need to call your doctor just uh, because you have an appointment or you're expecting the doctor or the doctor or your therapist to call you for that day. So you have a, a schedule in place already for what you do. Reach out to family members. You know, your, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, um, neighbors. So even though you cannot physically be around them, it still doesn't mean you cannot have that social interaction, which keeps life going. Um, um, all the things you can do also is to also make sure that you start, you think about projects that you can do. You know, during times like this, people tend to start new projects. You may decide that, okay, I'm going to take care of, I'm going to take care of, tidy up this room for this week. And you start doing things, you know, some thing structure. You start doing things in bits and pieces until the week is over. Then you start a new project. I'm going to look through this box of pictures I've had since the 50s. Okay. And I'm going to rearrange them. And so right. it's something that brings structure to your life. So there's a lot of things they can do and to stay engaged. Um, I think uh, keeping a good diary, reaching out to family members, to friends, to neighbors, um, making the appointments, taking care of their personal hygiene. And um, I, I think that will go a long way in helping them. Then on the other side, then the family members, the onus is also on them to be aware of the struggles of their older adults, of their parents and grandparents, and to understand that more than ever, they're going to need us to reach out to them, to spend time on the phone with them, to talk to them, to want to know what they're thinking, what issues they're having, what's stressing them out, trying to help them through it, listen to them. Um, for those who are able to, sometimes you know, I see people actually go drive through their parents' house every now and then, or sometimes go outside the house and wait by grandma or talk to them on the phone while they're looking at them. Anything we can do to make them stay more engaged, you know, that people really care about them. 
I, I think it goes a long way. So we can have it as part of our own daily routine to do more to support our older adult population. So I'm talking family, I'm talking friends. Then from a systemic perspective, um, there's so many things we can do. You know, um, I work in healthcare. As a healthcare provider, I have an obligation to reach out to my patients to see how they think. The good thing about about this period of uh, the pandemic crisis is that now we've had the opportunity to do more telemedicine. Right. So we can call up patient by telephone, or we can set up, so if they have the technology capability, we can set up um, the video conferencing uh, to actually see them while we have an interaction with them. So in my program, we've worked out a schedule so that we actually do more, we see them more frequently, and um, just checking, sometimes checking, just checking in with them. So I can do it one day as a doctor, the counselor will do it another day, a nurse could do it another day. If different people reaching out at different times, we just face it out so that the patients um, don't feel isolated in that sense. And the patients, that they tend to be very, very responsive to it. And anybody who works in addiction will tell you that some of the most engaging patient population we have are the elderly. They're yes. always very engaged. They appreciate every effort you're making for them. So, so we do things like that. Also, you know, you can now physically or uh, in person do 12-step um, meetings, in-person um, uh, support groups and all that. But if you have the technology know-how, sometimes you're able to do things online and be part of groups or support groups somewhere. On, it could be on Facebook, it could be some organization that have, electro, uh, that have online uh, groups where you can join and do things. So sometimes the elderly may not be able to know how to set that up. That's where the children come in. Mm -hmm. You can help them to, uh, or the provider, to help them go to know where to go to get those kind of groups. So we can do that. Uh, on a systemic level also, um, I think um, the other thing that we can do as a system is also to make sure that the, the more services are available based on whatever we're able to do right now to increase those types of services. One thing that's been very unique about the elderly is that they get shoved to the back. Um, we don't often think about them when we set up programs, when we set up services. It, there are a lot of non-age appropriate or age specific activities for them. And that's, that needs to change, especially now. We need to make more services available. That even if they don't leave their house, they can access a lot more services here and there. So those are some of the examples I have. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So again, you know, Dr. Ajabi was talking about how we need to do something right now. And that's why you all tuned in today, this very important topic. So again, how can Krauss help? You know, we have a program specific, specifically designed for the older adult. And if you have a patient you want to refer, you just need to call us at 470-8340 or have the patient call or the, your client. And we're here ready to help. And Lori, I'll bring it back to you for any questions. We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, well, we'll take care of the second one. Um, because I think a person had a wrong phone number. It says, do the ORS group at Kraus use Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance, and do you have their phone number? And you just, they ha I think they had a wrong number. Mm -hmm. So if you want to answer the question and then give them the correct phone number again. No, I put the phone number up on the screen. Yes, we do take Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance. Okay. Um, and then the other question is a multi- part question. Have you seen an increase in the need for your services since COVID began? And do you believe there are cases in the field now that are not being reported? And are you taking new referrals now? So three, three parts there. Um, I believe there's cases that are in the field that are not being reported. Absolutely. Prior to COVID, the COVID pandemic, um, my volume was through the roof. It was so high that they were going to add another person to uh, my caseload because the group volume was really, really, really high. These are the 15 older group I'm talking about. So um, after COVID, 
the admissions kind of, you know, um, trickled off because the, our patients were going out of their homes. They were told to stay home. So yeah, I definitely think that there's an increase out there that is not representative by our current numbers. So that's why um, everybody out there right now, the service providers, super, it's super important that they're looking for this. And um, our patients really, really enjoy being with each other, really talking to each other. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it's underreported right now. And then the third question was, Lori, can you refresh my memory? Are you taking new referrals now? Absolutely. Um, we're definitely taking new referrals. Um, one of the things that we do, we're doing right now is Oasis um, just recently approved us to begin to have small groups here on site. And we're still doing telehealth, robustly doing telehealth because that's what a lot of my patients right now prefer. Um, not everyone feels comfortable coming into the clinic at this time, but for the first visit, we do a face-to-face -face visit. Um, of course, you have to wear a face mask. Of course, you have to have your temperature checked when you come in. Um, so we're taking every precaution possible. And when we do start having groups, we're going to be doing it very carefully and thoughtfully. So that was, that was it for the questions. Um, unless there's anything else. We'll give it a moment. Uh, and I also wanted to reiterate what Karen said. If anyone is interested in this PowerPoint, she is willing to share. And she provided me with four resources that she mentioned about mental health services, transportation services. Uh, there are four. So if anyone is interested in any of that information, please feel free to email me after this webinar. It's L. DiCaprio Lee at verahouse.org, and I am happy to provide that information to you. So at this point, I don't see any other questions. So I am going to say thank you, Karen. That was Thanks, really, everyone. really great, great information and incredibly useful. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you, Brianna, for your interpreter services. And with that, I will end this webinar. So thanks everyone, have a great afternoon. You too. Bye.